Welcome to a new season of The O Show, Hamilton's Current Affairs Show. I'm Laura Babcock, and with just weeks away to a very important municipal election, we had Keenan Loomis back on the program to talk about his platform for mayor, and we're going to have Andrea Horvath on the next show to talk about hers, and maybe at some point Bob Rutina as well. All three of them came out of the gate in recent months with varying messages for you to pay attention to. And while some people who watch The O Show tell us that it's really the council races that matter the most, with the introduction of new strong mayor powers in Ontario, potentially for Hamilton at some point, this mayor's race matters a lot. We'll get into what these candidates are all about with our election panel and find out what they think are some of the races we should be watching for councillors, including whether or not the remaining incumbents can be beat. But first, let's take a quick look at the mayor's race. Focusing on the top three candidates, the ones most likely to get the job as mayor, they all came out with the brand that they wanted you to believe in. Keenan Loomis came out early saying that he was the candidate for change, something he's echoed here on The O Show. We also saw Bob Rutina come out and say, you know what, he is the candidate of experience that can get results. And he's done a lot of campaigning since. And Andrea Horvath came out with a message of optimism, but we, at the point of this taping, have not really heard what her platform is. We hope to find out on the next O Show. So what is the message that's resonating though? It's one thing for the candidates to go out to festivals, to give out peach Sundays, to meet a lot of different Hamiltonians, to show some hustle, but what are you thinking about their brands? Now, some of you are fans, and we're not going to include that. We'll let the panel talk about what they think is going well. Let's look at some of the criticisms, because I think they're pretty important to look at the brand negatives and to see what they're really all about. So with Keenan Loomis, while he has lots of brand positives, especially on social media, he does have some people concerned about what he really believes in. Is he a, prog a real progressive? Or is he a progressive uh, just for the purposes of the campaign to get some momentum, but maybe we'll pivot on policy once he gets the job. We also have, of course, Bob Bertina with his history and the baggage that comes from his time as mayor. Is he just having us relive his past or his dreams? Is he really about the future for the city? And then Andrea Horvath, so far without a lot of details on her platform, it seems as though her brand might be that she's hoping she'll win on name alone. Well, that's what you thought about it. Let's find out what our election panel thinks about it. Buckle up, it's going to be a great conversation. Here they are, the much anticipated and requested Osho election panel. I want to first introduce Dr. Emil J. Joseph. He is from McMaster University. Wonderful to have you back on the program, Emil. Great to be back. And of course, we've got Robert Pasuda. He is a former city councillor and a farmer. Robert, how are you doing? Just fine, Lauren. Thank you for having me on the show again. Oh, we love that you've sat around that particular council chamber and you can tell us what it's really like in there, Robert. So we love having you on the program. And of course, we have Graham Crawford, who uh, is not just a former citizen of the year, but also the co-founder of iElect, which has had a lot to do with how this election is unfolding. Graham, welcome to the show. Thanks, sir. I, for a second there, I thought you were going to say not just a pretty face, but I... Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you gave us some great analysis over the summer too, Graham, so I want to thank you for that. Our viewers loved it. And you, of course, can watch any older show on uh, YouTube. They're up there for everyone to get whenever they can take them. It's Margaret Skimba, you are not just a pretty face, to use Graham's <laughs> point. You are also a pretty fiery commentator in the Hamilton Spectator. I think your columns have become the go-to for what's the political current in town. And so it's such a privilege to have you on the program. Thanks, Laura, for having me. Well, I want to jump off with you, Graham, on this question, because uh, I know that I elect has not selected a slate of candidates or selected a mayoral candidate. But I had to ask Keenan Loomis when he was on last time about whether or not I elect was in fact influencing him, should he become mayor, because I think I elect's done a lot to raise attention around this election. So where are you right now? You can speak for I elect or for yourself when it comes to the mayor's race, because as I said off the top, with the new strong mayor powers, the mayor could have undue influence going forward. And so we need to pay attention. So where are you? Well, if I put my I elect hat on, I'll just say that really what I elect wants is for people to vote. So whoever you pick, pick somebody. Don't stay home. 
So let me take my I elect hat off, put Graham Crawford's personal hat back on and say, yeah, I've been watching the races uh, quite uh, carefully. Let me do them in reverse order to the way you did them. Or uh, uh, I'll start with, uh, with Andrea. And I, I must say, uh, I've been a supporter of Andrea. I've said this before. But I think what voters are going to be faced with is, do you vote, do you pick Andrea based on familiarity versus substance? Because there's been very little, I would say almost zero substance so far. When it comes to Bob Bertina, I mean, I think you have to make the decision. It's sort of radio Bob versus political Bob. If you like Radio Bob, and a lot of people did when he was on, he was very, very good as a broadcaster, and I would say not so good as a politician. So which one do you pick? If all you do is remember Radio Bob, you'll vote for Bob. And then when it comes to Keenan, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think he is facing a bit of a dilemma here. Uh, wants to come across as a progressive. I believe that he has very progressive views on many things. However, there are some things that uh, cause one to say, hmm, I'm going to need more clarity there. Area rating is one of them. Uh, public transit be remaining public is another one. Um, not so clear on that. So uh, it, that's sort of my quick cut on uh, the polarities in, in all three cases. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Emil, what's your take currently on the mayor's race? Um, yeah, I, I feel like I am trying to be as formed as I can. And I still don't have a good sense of who's who and what's what. I feel like with, with Keenan Loomis, I, I do see and hear and read a lot about, you know, potentially progressive stances uh, as a politician. And then you, you look at record and history and you're not quite sure. With Andrea, also I go with past record, you know, the kinds of things that I know about Andrea from times in municipal politics and in, in, in provincial MEP politics and leadership. Uh, so you're, you're kind of just hoping that, you know, some of those values will come forward, but we haven't heard very much. There's 47 days left, which is a long time. Uh, but uh, I think people need more information in order to make a clear decision. And I, I'm grateful for ILEC for, for doing a lot of the groundwork because you know, the information is there. There's a lot of candidates, uh, you know, across the wards and in the mayoral race. Uh, you know, one of the things that I'm really concerned about in the, in the uh, mayoral race is that we, again, have a white supremacist running for mayor publicly registered. Uh, and, and that, uh, you know, is indicative of, of some of the climate issues that people are concerned about here in Hamilton around hate. And I'm very interested to hear what the other candidates think of that very particular context here in Hamilton uh, in relation to uh, police reported hate crimes, people feeling unwelcome and, and what their stances are and what their plans are to address some of those issues. Great point. And I did ask Keenan when he was on last show about hate, and he said there is a hate problem in Hamilton and laid out some of his ideas around that. And certainly I'll pose that to Andrea Horvath and Bob, if I get the opportunity here on the O show. Uh, but thank you for reminding our viewers. I didn't use the name of the white supremacist running for mayor because I don't want to give this individual any kind of platform. But it does say that we need to be cautious and to be aware and informed about these candidates. Uh, so thank you, Emil, for raising that. What about you, Margaret? I mean, one of the things that I think helps with the dilemma that um, Dr. Emil brought up, the not really knowing where they stand on stuff yet, is policy positions that come out in the form of newspaper. One that we can talk about in a moment, perhaps, is where they stand on LRT and the unionization of the LRT and what's that, what that's going to look like. We got to see all three candidates weigh in on a specific issue in The Spectator. So, Margaret, where are you now with the mayor's race? And do you feel like you've got enough information so far? No, I well, I don't feel like I have any information. I've got what Keenan has been doing. And we already know who Bob Bettina is. He's already been our mayor. So how much more information do we really need in that respect? Um, Andrea has been on council. She's never been our mayor. She's been in opposition in, uh, in, in the provincial government for a number of years. Um, can, she, can she bridge that gap to become more collaborative? Who knows? Because 
we don't see anything. We don't know what the pop, we don't know what the the pro the platform is for her. She's good at going out there and meeting people and shaking people's hands and and doing that one on one kind of personality personable thing. But um, in terms of finding out what people are all about, I'm surprised at the lack of information actually that's out there, mm -hmm. particularly coming from Andrea's office. Well, uh, I'll have her on the O show next week. And as Joey Coleman tweeted when he saw that she'll be appearing on the show, he said, uh, will her platform be out by then? <laughs> you know, so I don't know if it will be or not, but you know, I'll certainly ask the follow-up questions as I can. Uh, Robert, uh, how are you seeing this election for mayor so far from your former vantage as being a counselor, but you know, as being a citizen with all the concerns that you have there out in Flambra? Well, <sighs> Laura, from what I've been hearing from the majority of people I've talked to, once again, as the panel has said, there's not enough information out there yet on the mayors and their direction they're gonna to take to move this city forward. Um, people have questioned me about Keenan, and I've met Keenan a few times in, in the past. Um, one of the residents indicated to me that did not Keenan say if he didn't get LRT in Hamilton, he was gonna move away out of Hamilton and go someplace else. That's troubling to them. LRT is here, but to say a statement like that is not very good for what would be a future mayor. Uh, Andrea is a hometown girl. Um, I'm using that term girl, but lady, but she is hometown girl and uh, she knows the city. I have seen her and when I was on Roman, uh, we've had chats about, she knows about agriculture. She's concerned about the rural areas. Mm -hmm. Bobertine and I sat for four years on council. Be careful what I say here. <laughs> but uh, he said when he was there, he's not there to make friends. He's the mayor and, uh, and we will follow what he does and how he says it. I did have a, a, I did have a challenge with him one day. I did a, we, we had farmer of the year and citizen of the year uh, banquet and uh, Mayor Bertine at the time went up to speak and present. And then I went up and well, he asked us to come up uh, myself Councillor Johnson and Councillor Ferguson, and we stood there and he spoke and he handed the mic back to the MC and I asked the MC for the mic and I spoke and I congratulated because both parties were from my award at that time. And then Brenda Johnson, Councillor Johnson took the mic and then Councillor Ferguson. Well, on the Monday morning at about 10 to eight, Mayor Bertina was at my door, standing at my door with his hands in his pocket. And he said to me, you two faced a-hole, don't you ever do that again. I'm the mayor. And I stood up from my desk. I was there earlier that morning. I stood up from my desk and what did you say again? And he said it again and he was mumbling some nasty words down the hall when he left. That is not somebody that's going to work with councillors if he was to be elected mayor. And that's the truth. So let's uh, get some more information. And, uh, and Mr. Bettina, at this time now, Mr. Bettina says he wants to be the transit mayor of Hamilton. And knowing the past history, how things come to this point, that is not good. That's not a good commentary. That's not a good view from his side of the fence. So let's leave it at that. Well, thank you for that, uh, Robert. As a former counselor, that's some important insight. And especially with the strong mayors thing coming in, you know, um, those mayoral powers, as our audience knows, Ford is going to give them to Toronto and Ottawa, mm -hmm. presumably to help get through some red tape uh, to get some affordable housing or housing built. Uh, but it extends beyond that. And suddenly we're in a system where we've got a mayor who's not just another vote on council and a bully pulpit. So if the person in the chair, <laughs> is not a collaborator uh, or has a history that you've just outlined, and there's other examples uh, I'm sure that people have experienced um, of his leadership style. That says a lot about who might be in the chair and how important this mayor's race is. So let me just ask you all one more question about the mayor's race before we move on to talk about some of the incumbents that are around that table. Um, but I, I'll go to you on this one, Emil. How important do you think the character of the person is running for mayor? Because I've always believed that policies and platitudes and platforms are gonna change as soon as there's pressure. And it's the character of the leader, who the person really is, their core values that determine how they're going to respond in crisis or how they're going to move forward in uncertainty. So how important do you think the character is of these individuals? I think it's uh, of the utmost importance 
what we've seen in Hamilton is a deteriorating trajectory of the ability of the mayor to listen, to listen to public outcry, to listen for calls for inquiry, to, to listen to feedback about scandal after scandal. And that has uh, been evident in delegations of community members bringing forward matters to council. It has been evident in, in, in council deliberations where it, it's seemed like over time, there's been an increasing antagonism uh, towards critique uh, and a shutting down of uh, opinions that he doesn't agree with. And I think that's the kind of thing we don't need going forward. We have a number of progressive candidates that are moving into likely uh, some of these council seats and, and, and some of these uh, wards with lots of competition. And, and we're going to need to move into a situation where we have a good listening mayor. Uh, and, and what, uh, you know, we just shared about Bob Pertina, that is not the kind of thing we need going forward. Uh, thank you. And to your point with the previous mayor, uh, Mayor Fred 2, 1.0 <laughs> seemed to listen a lot more than Fred 2.0 or 2.5, whatever it was. Right. So it eroded and, and it created a lot of tension in the community. And I, for one, was happy when he decided he wasn't going to run again, because I think we need a mayor who listens. But let me go to you, Graham. You know all three of these candidates one way or another. You've been very engaged in politics. And as she said, you were a supporter of Andrea's for a long time. How important do you think character is in the job and particularly the skill set or the habit of listening? Well, in fact, I think the character is, is the fundamental mm -hmm. difference between, and I'm not saying that uh, counselors, their character doesn't matter, but in terms of your point of the fundamental point about, you know, does the mayor only has one vote and that's true. But the mayor is the team leader, team builder, I hope. Uh, we have not had a team builder in that chair for years, many, many years. And Robert's story is one indication. And I've heard many nasty stories. Once the mic is off, the nastiness can come out. But, but in Andrea's case, for example, though, I mean, I, one of the things I reflected on, I thought, well, Andrea has spent many, many years in opposition attacking the present. That's what she was supposed to do. I want a mayor who's going to build and shape the future. And I have not heard anything yet that tells me that's what she's going to do. You know, like I said on a previous show, Laura, feisty, uh, scrappy, fine, but I hope we're past that kind of internal bickering. I want somebody to build the future. And, it, and if I can just one last comment, therefore about Keenan, I do know Keenan to be a team builder. The question is that people have in their minds is build what team though go, going in what direction? Mm -hmm. I will give him this. He's at least given us some information. In fact, I think he's given us a fair bit of information. The question is, is his character such that he will actually deliver on those things that we have to determine? But that's my quick take on, uh, on Andrea. And I make one other point about Andrea two by-elections. She's triggered two by-elections in order to leap and get a new job. She, and she's just been rehired. As a councillor, she did it in 2004. She'd just been re-elected in 2003 as councillor, and she jumped, triggering a by-election, which, is, as it turns out, interesting little bit of history, Bob Bertina won that by-election as councillor in War II, and she just did it again. She got re-elected, and she quit. Uh, I don't like that pattern at all. Margaret, where's the character for you in this discussion when it's these three individuals we're talking about from air? How much does it matter versus their stated policies and platforms? Right now, it matters everything because we don't have anything from some people. So um, in terms of in terms of what um, Graham has just said about Andrew, I have to agree with everything that he said, so I won't repeat that. Um, we've already said about Bob Bertina and Again, I don't really want to give him too much more oxygen because he's already been there. We know what we're getting. We know what we're getting. Keenan is an unknown. Um, the what I find interesting about, about this election, and maybe it's about elections in general, is the amount that candidates are telling their people that they're listening. I'm listening to you. I'm listening. Tell me. I'm. I'll listen to you, and I'll get back to you. These are the two things that that seem to be. Um, 
really top of mind. I mean, some websites, that's all it is, is asking for people to tell them what they think the issues are and what the solutions could possibly be. So um, that's all that also, but that also kind of speaks to a character as well. And I'm kind of getting off on this, but um, with Keenan, I'm thinking that he's listening and also adapting maybe some of his ideas to who he's listening to, to go to Emil's point about what kind of team is he building and where are we going with that? So um, listening is fine. Who are you listening to? And what are you doing with that information um, is, is really important. And that also speaks to character. Can we uh, trust these, can we trust people to do the right thing? Um, listen, admit that they're wrong, change course if they need to. Um, I'll leave it at that. So Robert, let me go to you last on this before we move on to some of the uh, incumbent council races. Margaret made the point that uh, with Keenan, not really known well enough to see what he'll do, but we've seen him adapting so far. He's made some changes in some of his stuff, just even here on the O's show and, and been quite open about the changes that he's made in his positioning on things. Uh, but you made the point earlier, Robert, that Andrea's hometown and, and you know, you, you've known her for years, you know what her values are. So do you think that there's something in that character that Hamiltonians are gonna to lean towards a commodity that they know uh, versus the one that they don't? Or do you think that Hamiltonians are looking for a change enough that they'll see maybe the character of someone like Keenan Loomis as being worth taking the risk on? Well, Laura, the people I've had discussions with do know Andrea, have followed politics because People, there's people out there that follow politics, whether it's you know municipal, provincial, federal, and then it's people that don't care. Right. The ones that have followed Andrea and now she stepped down from the leadership of the NDP and going into this mayor's race, they have some confidence in her. There's no doubt, as I said, being a hometown girl and, and knowing the area uh, and having political background has worked her way up to the province. Um, Keenan, on the other hand, people don't know about him very much. I have uh, told different uh, people to head to the uh, to Graham's show. I elect and follow that, and, and it's Graham. It's well put together. I've been following it, and so there. Some of them have gone to that. Um, I think Graham can be a leader if he listens. I mean, a good leader. <laughs> Graham's already a leader. You're talking about Keenan. Sorry, today. Graham. Sorry, Graham. Oh, yeah, you're a good leader too. People are listening to you, but. Keenan, if people, you know, if he listens to the people and if the councillors, the old councillors and the old garden and new ones can work together and listen to one another and, and collaborate, not this back room fighting back and forth and just go in for a vote and then go back out and then, you know, why do you vote that way and that? Get them to work together. It's city building. And that's the only way the city is going to move forward prosperously, you know, help the poor, help the the people, don't, the homeless, the businesses, just move forward. And uh, that's going to be a key thing for anybody that's back in the mayor's chair this time, because we haven't seen that in the 12 years that I was a council. Let's move forward to these incumbents. I showed a graphic from uh, Graham Crawford off the top of the show that showed all of the council colleagues that were there last term and who is not running again, including, as we know, the mayor, Councillor Collins uh, went to federal politics, Marula retired, Jason Farr tried to jump out, uh, didn't, wasn't successful, has cut, decided to come back in. Uh, but, you know, we have seen Lloyd Ferguson decide that it's time for him to resign. So there's been a lot, and Judy Partridge and Brenda, so there's been a lot of change. So let me start with you, Robert, because you sat around that horseshoe with some of these people. And there are still remaining incumbents like Brad Clark, who you would have worked with, and Maria Pearson and others. So what races are you watching with these remaining incumbents? Uh, and do you think any of them can be beaten or, or are they going to be staying for another term of council? Well, Laura, I'm watching them all because I worked with those incumbents that are in there. So I'm watching them and, and trying to figure out, is there a chance that they can be... <coughs> I guess ousted, if we want to put it that way. Um, I I was surprised in a way that Tom Jackson almost got acclaimed. Uh, I thought maybe more people would have come in on that one based on his experience and years around the council table. He's been there 
a long time, a long, long time. As I said before previously, that this is not a career, right? You're there for so many years to give your inputs, your thoughts, move the city forward, and then you move on, and go someplace else and do whatever else you were doing before, or, or even at some of our ages, we retire too, right? So um, I'm not sure. I think Councillor Jackson may have a challenge. I'm thinking pretty well he's going to have a challenge. Maria Pearson possibly is going to have a challenge in my mind uh, on this election. Um, I don't know. I don't think Maureen Wilson is, uh, she's in there, but I don't think she have a challenge. But um, Brad Clark, in my mind, will probably still be there after this upcoming election. He's uh, He's got some backbone to him. He's got some experience. And, and I've sat with him and had you know, debates and everything. And he's got it together, what he's doing. There's no doubt about it. He's good at that. Um, Councillor Farr, um, I, I think it may have hurt him jumping from, from a councillor to run for the, the Liberals, and then he did lose fairly badly there, even though he had help from Chad and, and other Liberals that were known to help out on the election. So that may harm him somewhat. Um, I think he's got a few good people running against him there that uh, have potential to go forward. Um, also, the the uh, the homeless in that and in, in tented cities that uh, Councillor Farr uh, moved the motion on is going to have an effect on him too. I believe if people are watching. There's no doubt. But you know, overall, um, I'm glad some of them have stepped aside and, and moved forward. We've got some new faces that'll be on council. So, and, and people have to remember that are running. You're running for for council. You get in there. What you think it is is not what it is, okay? And it's a big learning curve, and you got to work with the people, and you got to understand all the finances and that. It's just not I want to be a counselor, or I want to beat somebody, or I got my own one thought or initiative to do. You have to work as a, as a whole as a city, whether you're rural, suburban, downtown counselor. It's a it is a challenging job. There's no doubt. Well, thank you for that. Uh, very, very in depth. And I must say that your clip from the last election panel where you talked about it's not a job for life. We played that and it got thousands of views on social media. Uh, people really loved hearing a counselor say that this is not a job for life. Uh, Dr. Joseph, if I can turn to you on this. What I was kind of surprised to hear Robert Pursuta say that he thought that Tom Jackson could be viably challenged, um, but there are some some candidates running against him for sure now. What incumbents do you think can possibly be ousted from their seats, if any? That's a tough one. I, I think uh, the one that sits at the top of the list is Jason Farr. Mm -hmm. I think Cameron Kretsch, uh, you know, has a lot of support. Um, and as someone who is well known now, even more so than in the last time you ran, for being engaged and involved uh, and committed um, in a way that's transparent to a lot of people through his organizing and activism and uh, his work in the community. So I think that one um, is a race where, uh, you know, Cameron could come out on top. And I'm excited by a few candidates more so than I am about considerations about incumbents like i'm excited about uh kojo and in, in, in ward 14 i'm excited about uh linda lucasa and and uh i think I believe ward five and uh you know alec alex wilson who's who's challenging arlene vanderbeek in ward 13 which is huge uh people know alex here so i live in in, in ward 13 so i think that's that's a race uh that's going to be something um, Alex is, you know, uh, well known for also being involved in HWOD and uh, organizing and activism and thinking about matters that people care about, things that came through in the survey, things about the environment, things about housing, you know, and affordability and inclusion and, you know, the respect that people feel from council and leadership. Um, so I think those ones are interesting. I think, uh, you know, Narendra. Uh, Nan is uh, very well liked um, and well supported and is likely to keep that seat. Same with Maureen Wilson. Um, and then there's, you know, three, three or so wards with, you know, 10 or more people running, uh, which I, I'm not sure how, how things are going to land there. 
I know um, uh, people are very excited and interested in, in, in this election. And I think it's the kind of election where people have to be more informed or do a lot of research themselves because of the, the number of candidates running. Yeah, and you know what, uh, as I was listening to some of the races you found interesting, we decided over the summer here on the O Show to get to know some of the candidates, some running against incumbents, some running in open races now, as we know, Terry Whitehead did not register. So we talked to Ko Jo and we talked to Cameron, but we also talked to Tammy Wang, who I had never met before, interesting candidate, one of those packed races in Ward 4. We talked to Jeff Beatty, who is running against Maria Pearson again, uh, out in Winona to see where he would stand if he got on council, and Craig Kassar up in Ancaster, who was going to be challenging an incumbent uh, in Lloyd Ferguson, but now uh, is running in an open race against some uh, interesting candidates. So there's a lot going on. So thank you for that, Emil. And, and you've tweaked me to maybe doing some other candidate profiles as I was listening to you. But let me go to you, Graham. Uh, what are you thinking in terms of the remaining incumbency, because I think it's been a historic flip of council and maybe I'm wrong, but to have a mayor leave and to have six incumbents decide to leave for one reason or another, I think a lot of it public pressure, honestly, um, to have so many leave already means we're gonna have a massive change around the council table. Do you think more incumbents can be beaten? Do you think it's a, a, a wave, if you will, that is going to sweep through the city? Yeah, well, I think uh, you're right, Laura. Seven are not coming back. All, that's almost 50%. I think there are three who are at risk. Uh, and Robert has mentioned uh, them. Uh, so, so has Emil. Uh, I think Ward 2, Jason Farr, is very much at risk based on what I am seeing, hearing. Uh, Cameron Kretsch is the name I keep hearing, but there, you know, there are some other candidates as well. I think in uh, Ward 10, Maria. By the way, the reason I think these incumbents are at risk is because of the rumblings within their ward. They're not as popular as they used to be, the ones I'm mentioning. Mm -hmm. So I think FAR it, it has challenges. Uh, Maria Pearson has challenges. And Arlene Vanderbeek has challenges. Now, each of them have go good challengers as well, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. There are choices there. It's not just vote against the incumbent, but there's actually, there are people running who, you know, you want to see win against them. Uh, I agree with uh, Robert, uh, Brad Clark is likely to get back in. And Tom Jackson, I, I mean, I don't know what you have to do to, to move Tom Jackson at all. I have no idea. Uh, I would love, love it if Robert is right. Uh, and uh, Tom says goodbye, you know, they slap a name on the his name on a community center and he goes home and stays there. I, you know, whatever. Uh, but yeah, Tom, go home, just get out of the way. Uh, and volunteer, like I said before, Laura, try volunteering. Don't count on the paycheck every time, just do something because it's the right thing to do. Anyway, but those are the three, uh, Farr, uh, Pearson and Vanderbeek, I think are possibly in play. Uh, and just before I move off of you, Graham, I know you have had some concerns with one of the, ca the candidates that are running in Ancaster. And uh, Emil raised a concern about somebody who's running for mayor who's a white supremacist. Did you want to just touch on that? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's, it's fact-based. Uh, but Bob Maton is running in Ward 12 in Ancaster. Uh, and, uh, you know, I do want to comment a little later, I hope, on Craig Kassar, who's running there. But Bob Maton uh, ran for the People's Party of Canada. Uh, they're anti-choice uh, for women. They're anti-gay marriage. Uh, Bob is a climate change denier and an anti-vaxxer. It's fact, he's written this stuff. These aren't rumors, these are facts. That's the kind of counselor you want. I guess that's who you pick, but uh, I'd, I'd be running away from that person, not towards them. Uh, we also have, a, and we're not gonna do school board, but we do have some similar concerns on the school board. People who are you know, anti-woke, uh, we don't need to get into that because it's a whole other layer. But uh, but yeah, uh, this is why it's so important to do your homework. Don't just pick an, a name that you might recognize, even if it's a new candidate. Make sure you dig a little deeper. And that's why, and again, if, Laura, if I could put my I elect hat back on, uh, that's what I elect is trying to do. And thank you, Robert, for the kind words. We're trying to provide information um, so that you can, you know, you can ask your candidate directly. But you can all, you do have a resource in I elect, 
as well. We do have a questionnaire that we put to every single candidate. And thank you for that. And I haven't had a chance to go through them all, but I certainly will, especially in my ward, Tom Jackson's ward. I want to get to know what my options are. Thank goodness there are some to vote for. Uh, Margaret Skiva, where are you in terms of the power of incumbency? Have we seen the last one leave at 50% or might we get to 60 or 70%? And you did an excellent article recently in The Spectator about incumbency. So where are you with us at this point in September? So I think what's interesting, I pretty much agree with what everybody has said about the incumbents and um, the challengers. I'd rather focus on the challengers rather than the incumbents because they are more interesting. They've got something more to say. And, and the incumbents, in my research, it's shown that they're not as forward um, in saying who they are. Like they are counting on their, their, they themselves are counting on their incumbency. There are very few platforms, very few. It's like, you know who I am, you've already seen me work, so just vote for me again. But um, I would prefer to see them address some of the things like uh, Maureen Wilson in my ward. I wanted to know um, exactly why, she, why, what her take was on the past four years. That's what I wanna hear from the incumbents is I wanna hear from them is what their excuse was for why they did what they did, particularly around surrogate and why they should be trusted again, forget anything else, forget any platforms or anything else. That's all it needs to be done for that. And if they can address that and then sort of then move forward with the things that we need around affordable housing and infrastructure and, and all the, thing, the things that they have neglected for all of these years, then maybe we'll give them some space. But right now, the real interest is in the challengers who are coming up with um, ideas. They know what the problems are. They listen to the people. They're listening to the people. Um, may, they may not be coming up with their ideas yet, but they are going out there and seeking the information from the people. So it's, um, in, as far as I'm concerned, those incumbents are, you know, the power of them, I agree that there are some of them that are gonna be hard to get rid of. I hate that kind of language, but, um, but what I do think is interesting is that nobody's mentioned word seven, which is Esther Pauls and Scott Duvall. You know, that's, that's a bad choice. And it's unfortunate that in a couple of these wards, there's been so much interest, 10, 11, 10, 10. And then there's two in Dundas and two in, um, in Ward 7, which is, I think, problematic. I mean, I, I'm supportive of Alex Wilson in Ward, you know, sorry, me, in Dundas against Arlene Vanderbeek. Um, but this other, but this Scott Duvall and Esther Pauls, it's like a rock in a hard place. And I don't know what happened there. I don't know what happened there. Well, so. well said, Margaret. Um, and let me just throw this rapid fire, unexpected question at you because I'm getting it constantly. And that is what constitutes the old guard? Because it's a, a word certainly that I've been using for a while on social media and others have saying, you know what, old guard, a certain way of thinking, a certain way of operating, a certain raison d'etre for even being around that power table, right? And that old guard to me was pernicious and toxic and had to go. So I don't look at it as an age thing. I look at it as do you subscribe to and reinforce a certain system, an older system, one that I think, you know, has its time has passed. So what about Scott Duval? coming back in, is he the old guard in your estimation? What about Ted McMeekin coming back in? We haven't mentioned Ted trying to run out there and water down. And what about um, Andrea Horvath? Is she old guard uh, and Bob Bertina? Well, I think these are really good questions and ones that I've been asking myself when I've been going through this stuff because we've got candidates who are talking about infrastructure repair. Infrastructure repair is a decades long problem in the making. These people have been responsible for deferring. Now, one of our one of the main um, challenges or problems with council that I have is this deferral. You know, we defer decisions. We need another consultant's report. We defer, defer, defer. Uh, if they don't go into council, they're deferring. So, you know, um, we've deferred enough, and now we're at what is it? A three point six billion dollar infrastructure deficit repair bill? That's insane. You know, why, were, why wasn't this fixed under Ted McMeekin or Andrew Horwath or Scott Duvall? And exactly what did they do to either hampen or, or um, advance the needs of that? I mean, were they, were they 
uh, out there uh, advocating from, you know, for were they out there advocating for infrastructure or were they out there advocating for no tax increases because, you know, we can't afford it kind of thing. So um, that's, that's a good that's a good question. And as far as old guard, old guard is anybody who preceded the sewer gate mm. that election. In, in my mind, anybody who was preceding that would have been somebody. Anybody who says that's not the way we do things is. Well, old if you guard. look at someone like Ted McMeekin, though, he wasn't around during the sewer gate scandal, not on council at the time. And Scott Duval, I'm not sure when he left if he would left in time. Um, so that's where it gets a little mucky for me, right? They were part of old guard <laughs> council back in the day, but not necessarily that scandal. It's not the Sorgate scandal, right? It's the, this is the way we always do things. Sorgate became Sorgate because that's the way we do things, right? So if we've got a council that is still thinking about, well, that's not the way we do things, you know, then that's a, that's a problem. That goes to the thinking that you're talking about in terms of old guard versus new guard thinking or new whatever the new whatever is well um, thank you thank you for answering that off the top off the cuff and as we do our final round of questions here uh, and i'll give you each this is sort of a, a last chance to, to comment on what you want to comment on the election i just want to touch on something you said margaret around trust around how each of the incumbents who are running should answer for the last four years the 49 year secret deal for downtown right sewer gate the not releasing of the documents around their own red hill inquiry like why? Where was your vote on that? How can we trust you going forward? I think that's critical. And I actually did an op-ed the day that the election officially kicked off on May 2nd. And it was about that. This is not about a train. This is not about whatever wedge issue. This is about trust in this election. I reposted it yesterday after watching a weekend of news around who's going to run the LRT and thinking, no, not, not a fourth election cycle based on the train, right? We have to get to these bigger fundamental issues. And a whole lot of people have responded to the op-ed even months after its initial publication in The Spectator, because I think Hamiltonians don't want us to get sidetracked by a singular policy issue or a singular investment. They want us to change the way that business is done, to your point, the old guard versus whatever the new looks like. So as we go around the panel for our last round here on any other races you want to talk about or issues or whatever you want to leave our audience with to consider over the next month until we see you again on October, beginning of October, um, let me just pepper in, is trust, do you think, as important to the general population as it is to all of us here nodding away on the panel? And let me start, if I can, uh, with you, um, uh, Councillor Pasuda, what do you think, what do you want to talk about in, the, in your remaining minutes? What do you think is important for Hamiltonians and does trust really matter to people? Laura, trust is number one. There's no doubt about it. Uh, from what we've watched and, and seen what's happened there with, what you want to call them scandals, I guess, and uh, misinformation from, from staff coming forward and, and councillors knowing some of this information and not bringing it forward it's trust and who can we trust and we need to have trust in all the issues i know that um, and i'll mention his name councillor clark when i was there he always commented that when we're going to go in camera on an issue he said this doesn't need to go in camera this needs to be viewed by the public this needs to be open it's not worthy of going in camera and when i was there there was a lot of things that were questioned about why they're in camera trust and responsibility for your job it's um i think for some it's it's a paycheck it's a it's a decent paycheck for for people but you're making a commitment there for your community you're making a commitment for the city as you move forward um it's, it's going to be a challenge uh, there's a lot of people coming forward new people for council to be on the councillor's seat around the, the horseshoe we will need some people there that have got some past experience and dealing with the financials and all of the, whatever goes on around the city hall and the departments, planning and all of that. Um, if we don't, it's gonna be, be difficult, probably six months to a year. So people get accustomed to the different committees and the role and, and how to deal with staff and work with them. And uh, I think one of them that's, uh, it's caught my eye, particularly is, is Ted McMeekin coming back in Ward 15. He's got a lot of experience. Yes, he's been around a long time, but he's got good leadership skills, which I think he could put to use around the table um, to guide people. 
it's too bad in a way that for me, I'm thinking, because I've known Ted forever, uh, he probably would have been a good candidate, put his name in forward in mayor. But I know that when I talked to him last time, he said I'm just a little bit, I was a little bit too old. If it was 10 years earlier, he said I might have taken up the challenge. But I think uh, his background in that, he would have been a good mayor of the city. Uh, and, uh, and he likes to work with people. I've never seen him, you know, fight with anybody. He tries, he's, he's wordy, okay? He uses words and, and he's, he's pretty smooth at uh, working with people and getting things done. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's going to be an interesting election. As we just mentioned, Scott Duvall coming back. I was surprised he'd come back. He's, he got the city pension when he was there municipally. He's got the pension when he worked at the steel plant. You don't get any pension, I believe. You don't get anything as a, as a federal politician, but still he's had his time. He's got family. Let's, uh, you know, let's stay home and, and do that type of thing. But, and I know Scott well too. And uh, we've, we shared a few wobbly pops together. So it's gonna be an interesting time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll leave that. <laughs> it is. Uh, let me go to you, Graham. Um, you mentioned that you wanted to talk a little bit about Craig Kassar in Ancaster, but more broadly, uh, with both your eye as I elect, a co-founder with Ryan Moran, but also uh, as an observer of politics for a long time. You're one of the people who sits in the council chamber when the rest of us are at work as a retired, civically engaged person. Um, what do you think the role of trust is in this? And, and what are you wanting people to really think about over the next month before we come back together as a panel? Well, I think that this is a change election based on a lack of trust. We want more trust in our elected officials and it has been absent, which is why I think a bunch of them bailed in my opinion, but you know, they'll never admit that. Um, I do wanna just, just say one thing about I elect though, put my I elect hat on and say, cause we had a long discussion about, mm -hmm. well, what is the old guard? How do we define it? Where we came down on that, Laura, was three terms. So 12 years, if you've put in 12 years, uh, maybe it's time to move on. Yeah. And of course, we have, we have a panelist here who did precisely that. And, and I, he won't say this. I watched a lot of council meetings and I attended them. That is a decent person right there, both in, as a counselor, but also who understood his role. He, did, he served his community and then he went back to doing what he did for a living before that. That's all we're asking of many of these councillors and, and many I, of I them. Just, may I just interject uh, when we thought about who to have on representing council on this election panel, one of the reasons why our producers thought we should reach out to Robert Pursuta and only to Robert Pursuta was because he made the decision to leave. He was not, Robert, uh, I don't want to speak like you're not in the room here. Uh, you made the decision to serve your community and then go back to your farm and to serve your community in a different way and always carried yourself with dignity for those 12 years. So that's why, very much why we wanted you in here because you're a person of character and of trust. And if this is about a trust election, um, who better to have around the table than you? So thank you for that. Sorry, Graham, go ahead. Thank you, Laura. And if I can just add, Robert Pursuta would still be sitting at that table if he wanted to be, but he did, he chose not to, he did the right thing in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't always agree with the way Robert voted, but I always respected uh, his thoroughness and his rationale for, for the votes that he did cast. Um, so trust, it, it's, it's enormous. And this is why I'm very, very hopeful for people like Cameron Kretsch uh, and Linda Lukasik and Craig Kassar in Ancaster. Uh, I'm very, I, I don't know Alex Wilson. Uh, I know of Alex Wilson, but many people I know know Alex well, running against Arlene Vanderbeek and Dundas. Very excited about uh, about that. Kojo Dempty, I know very well and trust him implicitly. He will bring that to council. Very excited about that. I'm also excited about Jeff Beatty for the same reason. Decent person, strong community roots, um, clear thinker, uh, just a solid person. Um, and I, I, so I'm excited. I'm excited about all of those, those people. And there, there are others a, as well. Um, but just look at the names I just mentioned. These are all solid people. They're not just, you know, they didn't just throw their names in. They've been in the community working long before they decided to run. And that for me is a great measure and it increases my level of trust in them. 
And, you know, you reminded me as I was listening to you that we did also profile Linda Lukasik during the summer. So mm -hmm. people can check out that interview with her. And I got to know Jeff Beatty through the interview that we did here on the O Show. And I don't know Alex, I don't think. So I think I'll reach out and maybe see if we can do an O Show with Alex to get to know them as well. Um, I'm going to give the last word on this uh, show to Dr. Emil. So I, I want to just ask you, Margaret, you were so clear on what constituted the old guard for you. Um, as you're looking at the election now, what do you think is the role of trust? Um, and are you excited as Graham is that, you know, there are some really solid people running, maybe not against incumbents, but even in some of these, uh, you know, heavily populated races that could really make a difference if they get in? I do. I think I'm really excited about some of the people. Like I've gone through, I've tried to um, start uh, going through each of the wards and looking to see what I can find and looking to see what the ward needs and whether or not the people who are um, coming up through that uh, system are, are addressing the, the ward needs. And it, it's interesting, some people you wonder, are you really in this for the, are you in, what are you, are you in this for the resume or, or what? Because there's nothing, there's nothing. Um, but then there are some people who have really committed themselves to this and quit their jobs or taken a leave of absence like and gone out and are spending all of their time knocking on doors and and connecting with the, the constituents like Tammy Huang in, in Ward 4 and Cameron. Cameron's been at it since the last election. He's been building his brand and, and, and his knowledge about Ward 2. I mean, I don't know that there's anybody in Hamilton that m might know as much about Ward 2 than Cameron does. Um, and who else is there? And, and Craig, I echo um, Graham's words about Craig in, in Ancaster. You know, solid guy, looks like he's got all of the ducks in the row, knows what he's doing out there, you know, finding the issues from the people, um, building on that trust issue, you know. But if the candidates can get their trust uh, ele elevated out there or who they are, express their trustworthiness, then, um, then that certainly is a vote in their favor. More so, I think, any particular platform item, you know, because those, as you've said before, those platform items change all the time, right? But how they come to those platform items are what is the important thing. And do they listen? Do they collaborate? Do they um, bring other people together? So, yeah. Some of what I've enjoyed in meeting some of these new candidates that I had met was that they're value-based leaders in their own lives, in their own business. And so it's easy for them to explain how they come to decisions because they're very clear on what their values are. Uh, and one of the things that you mentioned was getting out there and building trust. And Craig Kassar posted something about being out in Ancaster and all the doors they'd knocked off, knocked on. And people were tweeting me saying, wow, uh, my old guard counselor had never come to see me, right? Like not just in Ancaster, but some of these other wards, this idea of no earning the job, you know, earning the vote. And my uh, neighbor, Tony, who's a septuagenarian, he made the comment and an immigrant to Hamilton and he said, you know what, they've got to earn the job as mayor and as council. They can't just think that we're going to give it to them. You know, so I, I think that's a very important point to building trust. You got to go out there and meet people and earn it. Last word to you, Emil. Uh, what should we be leaving our Osho audience with until the panel rejoins in a month? And, and what are you really watching uh, in this election? I think trust is, is the perfect word for all of what we've been talking about, you know, during the show, we started with how we are thinking about, you know, leadership and listening um, and, and thinking about, you know, how people have been uh, unhappy with how scandals have been addressed, how transparency uh, has been undermined. And a lot of these new candidates um, are potentially uh, new counselors have been platforming trust as as their platform yeah. you know kojo dante comes to this race being a trusted leader in the community one who is respected for being a great listener same with cameron kretz one who values transparency one who's been uh, advocating and organizing publicly for more of it and you know i think it's so important when we have that conversation about the old guard I think people have been worried about the practice of being an incumbent and learning how to wield the mechanisms and practices of city council, raising points of order, 
and kicking motions to committee where they know they're going to die because they want things to fall off the table, to fall off the agenda. And we want new people that we can trust because we know we can trust them because we already respect them to come in there and listen and use the infrastructure of council to get things done for a better Hamilton. How inspirational. <laughs> I love it. You're here. You know what? Uh, we have the potential for a better Hamilton. Listening to all of you and the 50% changeover we've already had, if we are thoughtful and we do our research and we meet the candidates and we really test them on trust, we might be able to really get this city going in a fantastic way to a better Hamilton. So thank you all, Dr. Emil Joseph and former Councilor Robert Pasuda and farmer extraordinaire Graham Crawford from uh, co-founder of I Elect and many other things, and Margaret Skimba, who does not just The Spectator, but also writes her own great ward profiles and puts them out there. So check out all of that and I elect, of course, and we'll see you next time on the O Show. Remember, if you're watching this program, you can subscribe on YouTube so you don't miss any episodes. And Andrea Horvath is going to be in the chair here next week. Uh, can't wait to find out what she stands for and what it would look like if she was the mayor of Hamilton. We'll see you soon. Take care.